the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Before we begin, please check out my show notes for links to portraits of the people discussed by Sophia in this episode. As the great-granddaughter of Mary, Queen of Scots, and granddaughter of James VI and I, Princess Sophia of the Palatinate lived a royal life. But it wasn't always glitter and gold. In this episode, Sophia will make reference to the death of her brother and father. And she speaks about how others made her feel and what they said. And it's through her words that we can get a better idea of who she was and how she felt. Something with history that we aren't always afforded. Today we begin Sophia's journey in her words. As at the age which I have reached, there can be no better occupation for me than that of recalling to memory my past life. I believe that I may indulge this inclination without risk of figuring in these writings as the heroine of a tale or of seeming desirous to imitate those romantic ladies whose lives have become celebrated by their extraordinary conduct. My object is merely to amuse myself during the absence of the Duke, my husband, to avoid melancholy and to keep up my spirits, for I am convinced that cheerfulness preserves health as well as life, which is very dear to me. I was born, they tell me, October 14th, 1630, and being the twelfth child of the king my father, and the queen my mother, I can well believe that my birth caused them but little satisfaction. They were even puzzled to find a name and godparents for me, as all the kings and princes of consideration had already performed this office for the children that came before me. The plan was adopted of writing various names on slips of paper and casting lots for the one which I should bear. Thus bestowed on me the name of Sophia. No sooner was I strong enough to be moved than the queen my mother sent me to Leiden, which is but three days' journey from The Hague, and where Her Majesty had her whole family brought up apart from herself, preferring the sight of her monkeys and dogs to that of her children. At Leiden we had a court quite in the German style. Our hours, as well as our curtsies, were all laid down by rule. Everything was so arranged that we knew on each day of the week what we were to eat, as is the case in convents. On Sundays and Wednesdays, two divines or two professors were always invited to dine with us. They believed that I should turn out a prodigy of learning because I was so quick, but my only object in applying myself was to give up study when I had acquired all that was necessary and be no longer forced to endure the weariness of learning. After dinner, I rested till two o'clock when my teachers returned to the charge. At six, I supped and at half past eight went to bed having said my prayers and read some chapters in the Bible. I led this life up to the age of nine or ten years. Suffice it to say that as my brothers and sisters grew up, the queen withdrew them from Leiden. The princes she sent to travel and kept the princesses to live with herself at The Hague. I had been left at Leiden with a little brother, a year younger than myself, who died at eight years of age. The sad news of my father's death was brought to the queen, my mother, at the time of his birth. The poor child suffered from the first, and one might say, as of him in the gospel, had this man sinned or his parents, that he was born so sickly, 
Still, he was very handsome, and I can remember one afternoon when the queen had sent for us to the Hague to show us, as one would, a stud of horses to her cousin, the princess of Nassau, that Madame Gorin said, looking at us both, he is very handsome, but she is thin and ugly. I hope that she does not understand English. To my vexation, I understood but too well and was deeply distressed, believing that my ill fortune was past all remedy. Yet it was not so great as that of my poor little brother, who died soon afterwards, in such terrible suffering that one shudders to think of it. His death on the ninth of January, 1641, broke up our court at Leiden, for to my great joy, it was not thought advisable to leave me there quite alone. Still, I felt regret at parting from my good old friends, who were no longer able to change their home and habits. I loved them from custom and gratitude, for sympathy rarely exists between youth and age. They were respected by everyone for their goodness, and having lived as saints, they died as they had lived. I was between nine and ten years of age when I came to live at my mother's court at The Hague, and I was lost in an ignorant admiration of all that I beheld. To me, it was as the joy of paradise to see such varying kinds of life and so many people, above all to behold my teachers no more. I was not at all abashed by meeting with three elder sisters, all handsomer and more accomplished than myself, but felt quite pleased that my gaiety and wild spirits should serve to amuse them. Even the queen took pleasure in me and liked to see me teased so that I might sharpen my wits in my own defense. I made it my business to tease everyone. Clever people enjoyed the sport while to others I was an object of terror. Among the latter was the Prince of Tarentum, who, not having wit to defend himself, fled from me as if I had been the plague. So many jokes of a similar nature, but quite unworthy of remembrance, took place at this time, that I prefer to turn my thoughts to a period somewhat later, when I began to grow rather more rational. The queen generally retired in the summer to a hunting lodge. On one occasion when her majesty was there, my sisters proposed to act the play of Medea to amuse her. They told me that I was to have no part because I could not learn so many verses by heart. This remark piqued me so much that I learned the whole play, even though I only needed to know one part. The queen was quite satisfied with my performance. The dressmakers had arranged my costume, and an actress had taught me the proper gesticulations, for I understood none of the verses that I repeated, in which, indeed, my youth was sufficient excuse, seeing that I was but eleven years old. Some time after our play, the Queen returned to The Hague, where the Queen of England arrived with Mademoiselle Marie to her daughter, who was betrothed to the Prince of Orange. The queen, my mother, went to meet her, and I was chosen out from among my sisters as being the fittest companion for the young princess, who was but little younger than myself. The fine portraits of Van Dyck had given me such an idea of beauty of all English ladies that I was surprised to find the queen so beautiful in her picture a little woman with long, lean arms, crooked shoulders, and teeth protruding from her mouth like guns from a fort. Still, after a careful inspection, I found she had beautiful eyes, a well-shaped nose, and an admirable complexion. She did me the honor to say that she thought me rather like Mademoiselle, her daughter. So pleased was I that from that time forward, I considered her quite handsome. I also heard the English milords say to each other that 
when grown up, I should eclipse all my sisters. This remark gave me a liking for the whole English nation. So charming is it to be admired when one is young. My sister, who was called Madame Elizabeth, had black hair, a dazzling complexion, brown sparkling eyes, a well-shaped forehead, beautiful cherry lips, and a sharp aquiline nose, which was rather apt to turn red. She loved study, but also her philosophy could not save her from vexation when her nose was red. At such times, she hid herself from the world. I remember that my sister, Princess Louise, who is not so sensitive, asked her on one such unlucky occasion to come upstairs to the Queen, as it was the usual hour for visiting her. Princess Elizabeth said, Would you have me go with this nose? The other replied, Will you wait till you get another? Louise was lively and unaffected. Elizabeth was learned and she knew every language and every science under the sun and corresponded regularly with the Descartes. This great learning, however, by making her rather absent-minded, often became the subject of our mirth. Princess Louise was not so handsome, but had, in my opinion, a more amiable disposition. She devoted herself to painting, and so strong was her talent for it, that she could take likenesses without seeing the originals. While painting others, she neglected herself, sadly. And after this short break, we'll return with the second half of this episode. My sister Henrietta, too, bore no resemblance to the other two. She had fair flaxen hair, a complexion, without exaggeration, of lilies and roses and a nose which, although well-shaped, was able to resist the cold. She had soft eyes, black, well-arched eyebrows, an admirable contour of face and forehead, a pretty mouth, and hands and arms as perfect as if they had been turned with a lathe. Of her feet and ankles, I need say no more than that they resembled those of the rest of her family. Her talents, by which I chiefly profited, lay in the direction of needlework and preserve-making. I must also mention that as the Demoiselle de Quat were unable themselves to follow me to The Hague, they wished to provide me with a person, after their own hearts, as my constant attendant, and for this purpose recommended an old maid called Gallen, whom I could not endure, for I thought her very disagreeable and was not alone in my opinion. Often I did hide behind some curtains or a piece of tapestry to give her the trouble of searching the house for me. I took a fancy to an English girl called Carré, who waited on my sister Henrietta. She was a modest young creature, not handsome but fresh-looking, with great taste in dress. Her elder sister, one of the Queen's maids of honor, was a person of remarkable prudence and judgment. The younger sister loved me from inclination, the elder from policy as well, and she saw that I was beginning to have influence and might some day be useful in pushing her fortune. She desired her sister to superintend my dress and to set me off to the best advantage. The task was an easy one for youth is in itself the greatest possible ornament. I had light brown, naturally curly hair, a gay and easy manner, a good, though not very tall figure, and the bearing of a prin other charms, now no longer reflected in my mirror, I do not care to recall. I prefer the pleasure of looking at my portraits taken at that time to the task of describing what is past and gone. Slander, just then, was very prevalent at The Hague. It had become a kind of fashion for the wits to sit in judgment on everybody's words and actions. My manners and behavior had been so carefully watched over by my two elder sisters that I was even more commended for conduct than for beauty. An old Englishman, Lord William Craven, 
took an interest in me. There was an idea that I might someday marry the Prince of Wales, who was a year my senior. My friends hoped for success because the English desired for their prince, a wife of his own religion. And at that time, there were no Protestant princes of birth, superior to mine, for him to choose amongst. My good friends were not alone in lifting their eyes to a prize so tempting. The princess, wife of Prince Henry of Orange, had formed the same plan for one of her own daughters, and also expected to succeed on the score of her religion. I was, as she thought, the only obstacle to her indomitable ambition. She held counsel with her husband on this subject, and determined to do her utmost to destroy my reputation, well knowing that the world is easily deceived by appearances. She resolved that her son, who was already married, should try to compromise me, believing that I would permit, without alarm, the attentions of so distinguished a prince. A German valet named Fritz happened to overhear the discussion of this plan, and, being a well-principled youth, was so shocked by its wickedness that he at once informed Streithagen, the minister of my brother, of all that he had heard. Time soon proved that he told the truth, for the young prince, by his mother's orders, appeared regularly every evening in my mother's antechamber. It was all, however, labor lost, for whenever he appeared, I retired. Driven to seek some other means of setting the world talking, they made the prince arrange a ballet in which my brother Prince Philip could not refuse to join. Neither would he, as they thought, derogate from his rank by practicing it at the court of Orange, instead of in his own apartments. But my brother, who saw through this scheme, circumvented it by declaring that his room was too small, for he easily perceived that their object was simply to gain freer access to our court, so as to make the world talk. They then employed the Rhine Grave, who dared to tell me that I might, if I pleased, govern all Holland. I replied that he had better give such advice to his own wife, who was, I believed, far too good to follow it, as she was greatly superior to her husband. Meanwhile, I was much courted by the English nation, who took endless trouble to please me, and for all the very shadow of a chance, for the affairs of King Charles I were in a desperate state. He himself was a prisoner in the Isle of Wight, and the Prince of Wales, for whose sake they made so much of me, had come to take refuge at the Hague. We saw that he was a prince richly endowed by nature, but not sufficiently so by fortune to allow him to think of marriage. Several of the English, however, thought of it for him, even after the terrible death of the king his father, which made him king by succession. A rising also took place against Cromwell, the chiefs of which were in my interest, but like the king, their master, they had the misfortune to be betrayed and beheaded. Among those who sought their own fortune in my service was the Marquis of Montrose, being a good general and a man of great ability, he believed everything to be attainable by his courage and talent, and was certain of re-establishing the young king if his majesty would appoint him viceroy of Scotland, and after so signal a service, bestow on him the hand of my sister, Princess Louise. The commission was granted by the king, notwithstanding the opposition of the hostile Presbyterian faction, headed by the Duke of Hamilton and Lord Lauderdale. The Princess of Orange, seeing that they were opposed to Montrose, set them down as my enemies also, plotted to such good effect that the Presbyterians turned against me in favor of her daughter, being persuaded that I was no good Presbyterian because I went to common prayer with the king 
Montrose, meanwhile, went to Scotland in the Parliament, where I was also with the Queen my mother, offering the crown of Scotland. On conditions, he gave up Montrose, swore to the covenant, and acknowledged the Parliament as lawful. The king suffered himself to be persuaded by the enemies of Montrose to grant all this in order to secure the crown for himself. Deeply shocked, the more so on hearing that the gallant Montrose had put to a cruel death, as may be read in the history of England. I had noticed other signs of weakness on the king's part. He and I had always been on the best of terms as cousins and friends, and he had shown a liking for me, which I was much gratified. One day, however, his friends Lord Garrett and Somerset Fox, being in want of money, persuaded him to pay me compliments on the promenade at Vorhoit. Among other things, he told me that I was handsomer than Mrs. Berlow, and that he had hoped soon to see me in England. I was surprised by his speech and learned afterwards that Somerset Fox's object was to induce me to ask Lord Craven for money for the king, which he, Somerset Fox, meant to share with his comrade, Lord Garrett. I was highly offended, but the queen, who had noticed his majesty's marked attentions, was just as much delighted and blamed me for not going to the promenade on the following evening. I made the excuse of a corn on my foot, which prevented me from walking. My real reason, however, was to avoid the king, having sense enough to know that the marriage of great kings are not made up by such means. I also remarked that the king, who used to seek my society, avoided it in the presence of the Scottish deputies. All these circumstances combined proved to me that my friend's plan would come to nothing, and that, where I remain in Holland, I should doubtless be subjected to the mortification of losing the esteem in which I was held. For those persons who now paid court to me would do so no longer when they came to perceive that I was powerless to reward them. I remember the amusement, the folly of certain persons who sought thus to push their fortunes how they vied with each other as to which among them should best insinuate himself or herself into my good graces. Chief among the ladies, though belonging to different factions, were Mrs. Herbert, Mrs. Stenton, and Mrs. Waller. These good ladies were each other's rivals for my favor, and I often used to enjoy a hearty laugh at their expense with my faithful friends, the Curays old Lord Craven frequently taking part in our mirth. Lord Craven was a very valuable friend, for he possessed a purse better furnished than my own from which to provide presents for my partisans. He also had refreshments standing ready, and used to give away quantities of little ornaments, such as would delight young people. He needed all of these attractions to make him agreeable and to enable us to tease him a little in private. In order to shine in conversation, the good man used to say the oddest things. One day he declared that he was able at pleasure to think of nothing, and shutting his eyes said, Now I'm thinking of nothing. And that's where we'll end this very first episode in this series on Sophia of Hanover, in her words. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you're still interested in learning more about what you heard today, please don't forget to check out the links in the show notes. Until next time, I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, 